Great, thank you. Um, so my name is Royce Giddens. Um, we are both at the University of Texas at Austin. And um, our, our topic today in the schedule was, does researcher participation in online networks democratize knowledge production and dissemination? And we're going to kind of broaden that a little bit and talk about scholars. Um, because we didn't want to just focus on research. We wanted to look at um, kind of a, more, a broader interpretation of what academics do um, and to consider how, as academics participate in online spaces, how that, or what are the barriers to um, democratizing knowledge and democratizing dissemination and learning to do it. Um, so basically what we're going to do today is we're going to start with a few, uh, probably for the first 15 to 20 minutes, just kind of give you some background information about what we're talking about, kind of set the stage. We're going to talk about two specific examples of what we think are some barriers. Um, and then we're going to open it up to discussion. We're going to spend the rest of the time just discussing your own um, experiences, your own research that you have read or have conducted, um, and to, to open up the floor and learn, learn from you as well. So, um, in, in recent years, we've, we've seen uh, a new practice emerge with regards to how scholars are participating in online spaces and in online networks. And we've tried to, to define that in terms of um, in terms of participation for the purpose of sharing, reflecting, critiquing, uh, improving, validating, and furthering our, our scholarship. And by scholarship, as Royce mentioned, we're, we're both referring to research and teaching practice. And just to give a few examples of you know what this looks like. Um, people who have been, or I guess, um, academics who have been participating in online spaces, um, you know, with kind of an intent towards openness and an intent towards sharing, have been called have been called digital scholars. And Martin Waller has just recently published a book on that topic. And if you haven't read it, I I, um, I would recommend it. And it's published under an open access license. Other people have referred to these individuals as open scholars. For example, Terry Anderson and uh, Gideon Burden uh, have used that term. Um, and so ideas, or I guess examples of you know, what these people do in online spaces um, range from like um, going on Facebook and sharing images of you know, um, something that you have found and then asking individuals to either make recommendations or, or provide suggestions for it. So for example, a couple months ago, um, there was a group of ichthyologists. These are, are people who do research on, on different fish species um, who are examining uh, fish in a particular a remote lake. And they found a number of fish, and they were not able to categorize them, right? So they posted pictures of this fish on Facebook and invited their colleagues to, well, chip in and, and say, you know, well, have you encountered this before? What does it look like? And what is this? Um, it was pretty amazing in that within a couple of days they were able to identify 90% of the fish that they had uh, collected some of them. Um, other examples include you know, sharing our own lectures on YouTube or other um, video sharing sites. So for example, you know, this presentation is going to be on YouTube by the end of the day or by tomorrow. Um, going on Twitter and asking colleagues for input or you know, pointing out links to the content that we post online like our syllabi or activities. Um, you know, sharing our bibliographies on Mendeley and sharing our emerging research agendas or you know papers that we have in draft, not waiting for them to appear in journals. You know, two years after they're done, but sharing kind of an in progress work and getting feedback on, you know, is this is this going well? What, what do you see that you're doing research on the same topic emerging? How can we collaborate and um, and create essentially create a better future for ourselves, right? Because that's in some ways that is the that is the assumption here and the ultimate goal, right? To learn from each other, to grow and enhance our work. Um, so participation in these ways, um, the saying goes, democratizes knowledge production and dissemination. We're sharing our work, we're getting feedback from each other, and we're doing it in such a way so that um, it's not closed behind um, gates or subscriptions or institutions and so on. And to put it more bluntly, these are not just unstated assumptions that we have, right? We're, we're pretty open in how we think openness and technology, especially participatory technologies, are going to help us propel forward. Um, 
So just a few examples. Uh, these are quotes from colleagues on the field, right? Information technology is the greatest opportunity for scholars um, in this age, or anyone can learn anything from anyone at any point for free. Um, or this notion of how technology is going to flood how we're currently thinking about education, how are we thinking about research, how are we thinking about teaching. Um, and that this technology is having the greatest pot potential for change. So, in a way, we're a very positive field, right? We see um, lots of positive things happening, um, or positive changes coming by as a result of this technology, as a, as a result of these practices that we're embracing. And it is not often that we stop and take a time to reflect on the challenges and the obstacles. And this is what we're trying to do right now. And Neil Selwyn actually charges that this positive outlook that exists in the field prevents the field from being taken as a place of serious discourse about technology and change in education. Um, so we're not, we're not trying to critique ourselves just for the sake of critiquing ourselves, right? We're trying to critique ourselves to see what obstacles we're facing and how we can overcome them um, to serve both ourselves and our students better. So we'll talk about two of these obstacles and, and then we'll open them. So the first obstacle that we, we want to talk about um, relates to the types of environments that we participate in online. So when we're using a tool online, using a different social networking platform, so considering my Twitter, or Facebook, or an IRC channel, um, each of these systems has inherent within them certain assumptions about who we are, how we want to participate, how we see ourselves, both as people, as educators, as scholars. Um, so up here at the top, you see some images. So like for Facebook, for instance, if you think about Facebook, Facebook from day one has argued that it is an authentic identity platform. So its goal is to present yourself to the community as you authentically are. As we think about that, though, there are some assumptions that go along with that, right? So Facebook then therefore assumes that I have an authentic identity, first of all, and that that authentic identity um, you know, doesn't change. It's the same for every, for every context that I'm in. You know, we see issues with this arising or kind of a, a response to this with Google, with Google Plus when they came out with circles. Um, this context, or this idea that, you know, as I'm participating in social networks, it's important for me be able, to be able to contextualize who I'm connecting with, right? Because the way I participate will be dependent upon how I see myself in those contexts. Um, but recently, Christopher Poole, otherwise known as Moobs, the founder of 4chan and a few other um, prominent internet projects, um, argued that both Facebook and Google Circles have gotten it wrong. And he basically says that it's not about the audience, it's not about the context, but it's more about, it's more about who you share with. I'm sorry, it's not who you share with, it's who you, it's who you share as in your context. So thinking about how these different systems that we participate in online, how they force us to kind of change our identity or, or accept a certain view of our identity. And if you look at the literature on identity, uh, different people approach it in different ways. You know, some in kind of a traditional rationalist approach is that I have this real identity, um, that it exists, it's, it's uh, essential to myself, right? And it exists outside of any social participation. Um, in other literature, though, we see, we see differing views. We see views where identity is structured based upon how I participate with my community. Um, so then I have like the social construction of identity. You also see people who argue for an idea of multiple identities. So basically I have one identity in one context, one identity in another, um, or that my identity is chaotic, or that it changes, and that it, as I am in one context, I'm doing, I'm being one person there, that being someone else, some or in another context. And so all this kind of just is meant to bring up the issue that these systems have within them embedded a certain assumption about how we see ourselves and how we identify. So contrast you know, Facebook and Google Circles with Anonymous. So Anonymous is a hacker group. Um, they predominantly, predominantly use anonymous IRC channels to communicate with one another. And so obviously, if you're going to try to coordinate an attack on the New York Stock Exchange, stock exchange um, as they did a few weeks ago, um, you're going to want to participate in these online spaces in a very different way than you would in Facebook, right? 
so to kind of get into this and think about you know, how scholars see themselves and their identity in these spaces, we did a phenomenological study recently where we went and talked to scholars about their Facebook use. And these are scholars who, you know, they're not IT people, they're not open ed people. These are college of education people who just happen to be using Facebook for, for varying reasons. And you probably haven't been listening to me, you've probably been reading what they said. But, um, but here we have three different scholars. These are all um, researchers and, and teachers. So they are, these are tenure track or tenure professors who teach courses and who also conduct research. And from these comments that we receive from them, we see that they see themselves in very different ways. So let's just look at this first one. This first, first scholar says, my position, my position as a professor is building a community of teachers that, that I talk to, where you can share, and so participation in these spaces makes total sense. So this faculty member, she used Facebook, she connected with her students, she, it, was her, it was her primary way of communicating with the teachers that she worked with. Um, and I think a lot of us probably at this conference can kind of resonate with this, with this understanding of how we see ourselves as educators. Here we have another educator though, she says, I made Facebook this hybrid space. So she entered into it thinking, oh, I'm going to use it to connect with personal people, I'm going to connect with professional people, which in and of itself assumes, right, that I have different identities and different contexts, right? And sometimes it's really annoying, she says. I keep thinking I should be writing or looking at data and I'm doing this. I think that I created the conundrum I live in now. And she kind of goes on to explain that her use of Facebook has declined over time as she's come across problems associated with this hybrid space that she's created it. So basically she's, she's discovered that she has kind of a multiple identity, or she has an understanding of herself as having a multiple identity. And by using Facebook, those identities have been collapsed. And this is similar to what Dana Boyd has talked about with convergence, identity convergence. And because this professor didn't have the forethought or wasn't aware of this under, of what the assumptions of the, of the tool was, um, this has led to issues for her. And then this last example, this professor says, all the insert expletive here is not really worth it, talking about Facebook. I think that it's okay for students to not know everything about their professor. These practices add to the complexity of those who struggle with the homework balance and the technology pull. And ultimately, talking about his students and even his colleagues, he says, I don't have time for you. So if I'm a tenure track faculty member, I'm focused on my research, I'm focused on teaching, um, and I, at the same time, I'm trying to balance a family life and, a, and, a, and a, a life that I find to be meaningful, I don't have time to be constantly checking in with you, checking to see if you know, what I'm saying is appropriate in all these different contexts. So just from this little example, we can see that the way scholars see themselves is very different. And as a result, as they participate in these online spaces, they will be led to participate in them in different ways. So just looking at this, we can kind of guess, right, how each of these would probably participate in Facebook, or whether or not they would. So just to kind of tell you the answer, this faculty member ended up using Facebook a lot. This one used it first and realized it created problems and then stopped. This one just had an account and doesn't ever use it. All right. um, does anyone know what this is? It's what? The Aurora Boreal. It's a network map. Social network analysis? Yeah, it's a network map of the internet. It's really pretty, isn't it? And it's pretty amazing in that this is what we participate on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's made of, of nodes and connections and all of that stuff, right? So the assumption underlying this discussion is that individuals can participate on the internet um, in an equal manner. And they can all reap the benefits of this participation, right? Sharing our syllabi with each other, having conversations with each other. We can create a better future for ourselves, right? So the web is a platform. And by participating in it, um, we can reap the benefits of it. But what skills are required to participate effectively on, let's say, Twitter or Facebook or any of the other social platforms that we've been seeing? Anyone want to venture a guess? What skills would be necessary for us to be effective on these spaces? Communication skills. Okay, communication skills. Time management, yeah, that's Writing. a good one. Writing, composing. Writing. Composing, okay. Right, those are those are good ones. Some other examples are 
the ability to filter information and direct their attention to information that's important versus information that may not be important, right? Um, the ability to keep up to date with the information, tag information, be able to retrieve it when we need it, right? If I'm on Twitter and I have, uh, and I'm following 2,000 people, and you can see, and you have something like TweetDeck, for example, you can see the information going by, right? And after a couple of minutes, you're not able, well, you aren't able to go back, but after a couple of days, you won't know um, where that important tweet came from and where it is, unless you're able to you know, tag it effectively so that you can retrieve it when the time comes for it to be necessary. Um, but even though you know, we might train people in, in these skills and we might prepare them for the skills that they need to participate effectively, does that mean that everyone um, will be able to participate equally if they have the skills? And the question, the answer is no. Um, for example, issues like power, so who do you know and who you're connected with, and issues connecting to resources, time and money, will contribute to making participation in online spaces unequal. So because I know various people that say, well, I don't, but um, let's say someone in the audience knows someone who is well known in the open ed community, they might get you know, various opportunities in furthering open, ed open education. And someone else who doesn't know any people but might have great ideas might not be able to tap into those networks to promote their work and be able to get connected with people that might be able to further their work, right? So unequal participation is not just a matter of skills and knowing how to do things online, but also having access to you know, networks and knowing how networks work and having that power. Um, so I guess the, the important point here is that some people might be able to exploit the riches of the online space um, better than others. Sure, jump in. Um, I'm just going to say, isn't that where such things such as clout comes in when you want to try to measure or look at potential metrics around your influence structures in, in, in social media and so forth, which is kind of precisely that, to say how do you get your message out, how many followers you have, or what is your clout score? Sure, so cloud is a, the way that I understand it, it's a metric engine, right, that, uh, that evaluates your, um, your impact on others, is that correct? Kind of, yeah, and there's other ones in, other than cloud too. Sure, sure. So, so you see at the same time this increase in, in kind of services that, um, that evaluate either reach or, um, or access to networks or whatnot. Um, there's a similar service with regards to blogs, right? The Technorati um, camp um, score, or whatever that was called. Um, so, so now, so we just kind of touched on two barriers that we think, or two two issues that uh, we need to think about in relation to to this idea of democratization um, in, in participating in social networks online. Um, so now we're going to kind of open it up. Um, so. We have other issues that we think are important as well. We have things that we think are barriers um, also. And so we, have, we could talk about those all day, but we don't want to. Um, but we'd like to um, open it up to you and, and help you, or give you the opportunity to share with us research findings, relevant projects, and firsthand experiences on um, issues related to this. Um, we will be keeping notes here um, at firepad.net slash scholar. Um, and And, and again, if we want to keep, if we want to talk about some of the other issues that we already have brought up, that would be great too. So, and, sorry to interrupt. And it looks like some of you have already gone there and had notes. So please feel free to do that while we're, you know, having this conversation. And we'll pull out Pirate Pad just to have it there as a kind of shared space that everyone can look at to see what's going on. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, I suppose I would like to um, question one of your assumptions here. Um, which is that democratizing knowledge production is necessarily a good thing. Because part of what makes knowledge production work is that some people uh, are better at it than others. Um, there's a reason why some people have professor in front of their name, uh, and, or doctor. There's a reason why when you go to see a medical doctor, you go there rather than somewhere else, because they've got special knowledge. Right? So um, 
I would construe this as a tension between democratic forms of knowledge production and expert-based forms of knowledge production. And I wouldn't want to assume that make, making things democratic is necessarily better in every instance. So how would you respond to that? Um, well, I would just say that, um, I mean, this, I think this is, a, this is an important critique, right, or an important question, um, and it's a question that's been asked quite a bit. Um, I mean, obviously, the traditional power structure has, has limitations as well, and obviously a completely open power structure as, with regard to, to knowledge production and dissemination has issues as well. Um, and I don't know that necessarily we're looking for a middle ground, but um, yeah, it's important to understand both the value of each and the limitations of each. Right, and um, so I, 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 you know, can't say you know if this is superior or whatever. But but there are, there are issues associated with each for sure. Yeah, I mean, I would just say that you know, it's not a sort of stark distinction between the two in the sense that you know, how does a medical doctor come to arrive at a position of expert knowledge? Well, it's through becoming part of the community, right? So there's this, still a democratic and you know, forms of peer review of democratic processes. So it's not a choice between one or the other, but it's working out where are the appropriate forms of knowledge production according to different kinds of um, different kinds of products. Basically, there's going to be different models there. I think maybe you just need a bit more refinement in how you put that forward. That's all. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think you know we're arguing for any extreme for democratic participation. Well, democratic knowledge production, right? Obviously. Um, we wouldn't expect someone who, you know, has never done research to put out a blog and say, well, this is my research and this is what you know, everyone should be, should be doing to, um, to open up education and whatnot. Um, and, and those are understandable. But there's also various levels of democratization, right? So, so for example, um, so being a faculty member, you know, I can publish in various journals, and some of the journals are open and some are, are closed, right? So um, what steps can I take towards democratization if my institution, um, you know, values certain journals more than others, right? And how can I safeguard both my work and my position, but also contribute to, you know, providing this knowledge that I'm creating to people who might not be able to have access to it? They don't have the same amount of resources to do so. Um, and yes, it's, it's a complex topic, and we all know that. Okay. Yeah. So we've been working with some groups of scientists. On, I mean, I was, after working with Terry Anderson, we were looking at different ways to open up some of the process. And what we ended up with, with our, for instance, Geophysical Institute, is working with groups who have large grant projects, not trying to open up a process along the way because of various political and other issues, but at the end, instead of the standard research report, we're working with NSF grantees on creating what are essentially open courses explaining what their project was, what they learned, and where you can go from there. Because one of the big problems with all of this and keeping it kind of closed is that you end up with the final public report being something incomprehensible and unusable to anything but other scientists. And so we were kind of shifting that and actually getting funding written into the grant model to say we're going to create this kind of open course for people to understand what we've done and what we've learned. So the way that I'm understanding is that there's various um, different areas within you know, a project where openness might come in and one not might necessarily be you know, sharing our data while we're analyzing it, but it might be you know, sharing how we went about and we're successful in this And project. even more, the public the public face to say why does this matter as opposed to so the, the meaninglessness of the reports was a big thing for us and then the problems with opening up process along the way which I'm, I'm all in favor of uh, often is you know climate change for instance data you don't want to release necessarily without that aspect. I mean, yeah. 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 So, so in response to the, the person who said you know we have this fear of making the knowledge too open and too democratic. Um, while it could be argued that anything could be put on the internet and made searchable by Google, there are a lot of things that you won't know whether, whether it's good or valid um, for your field or not unless people in your field somehow through conferences or what have you tell you 
to look for that. So while it's out there for anybody to share, there's still that level of face-to-face of -face communication to even inform people that it's there. Because if you look for it, if, if you're looking for information on a topic, do a Google search or do a database search on, on a topic, you may or may not know that that resource is the one. As far as a resource not being the one because the information is faulty, if you are a person who is knowledgeable in your in your field, you know, in your field of your content and you, you see that, you know, you'll take it as a joke. You won't take it seriously. Because you'll have the background knowledge to say, well, this is valid and this isn't. So as far as democratization of knowledge and open courses and open resources, um, you know, even though it's out there, there still has to be that seed planted in a face-to-face -face environment to let people know that this is what's out there, or this scholar did this, or this research was done, or this paper was created. I wouldn't have known half the things that are happening if I didn't go attend this conference in person for these three days and learn about all these other things that are happening in the country and the world as far as open education, even though it's open and it's out there. Sure. So I hear two things from what you're saying. First, this idea of the individual, um, you know, once he or she finds something to be able to vet it, either based on their background knowledge or, you know, on, on skills regarding, you know, questioning the validity of things that are available online. Mm -hmm. But secondly, is this idea of finding things that are out there, right? Just because I write a blog and uh, you know I update it every other week or whatnot, doesn't mean that people are actually going to find it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't also mean that um, the people who are going to find it are people who I have never talked to before, right? So I always make this joke that two other people are reading my blog, and those are two of my students. Because I shared it in my time. So, are we just talking to each other but on a different medium? Are we just, you know, talking within our silos? Um, are we having an impact outside of, you know, let's say, open education when we're writing about how to improve education with technology or whatever? More fundamentally, the person who spoke up front kind of spoke as if this understanding of who the experts are and who the expert communities are is uncontroversial and clear. And one of the issues with opening up science, to my mind, is opening up to divergence on other viewpoints. Our you know, slavish devotion to the scientific method aside, there is controversy here. And one of the ideas of protecting is not only to create artificial scarcity, which I think is a problem, but is in order to create a kind of a closed system where you're not getting the critique from the outside. I don't know who the experts are, and everybody thinks they are the expert, but they know who the experts are. So you, got, you have to open it up to see something other than that. Well, I mean, and just kind of to, to bring that in with what you were saying, I think it's also interesting to think about, you know, you know these, these groups of scholars online in different fields, right? So if we look at like the open ed group here, right? Um, if when we're tweeting about what's going on here at open ed, how many people outside of the open ed kind of sphere are seeing that? So we're talking about opening up these, 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 types, of, these types of networks to people on the outside. Um, ultimately, what happens oftentimes is that we have these echo chambers online or that we just connect with people who, who we agree with, right? So my entire online experience, my entire participation online is shaped by the people who I, I already agree with, right? So if I'm, if I'm already a self-styled expert, I'm just going to, uh, to connect with people who, who share, my, share my opinions, right? So, so it's a question um, that it seems like a barrier, right? So that, I mean, yes, um, it does pose the, the potential for opening up these types of closed systems, but at the same time, it might just be a replication of closed systems or, or more closed systems. Excellent for radio. <laughs> the, um, well, kind of along all of these lines, there's the, the notion of the, the power differential within the networks and, and how that a lot of times is exploited by, by folks that do just that, but they do it for a purpose. And so they, back to what I mentioned a minute ago, they, they, you know, they intentionally you're, you're intentionally having folks that are getting online presence and getting more and more networks and getting more and more connections and, and increasing their, their network power. And potentially you have folks that do that for a reason. 
And, and uh, you know, there's the medical engineering, for example. Uh, these are things that DARPA is very interested in right now and how to combat that, how to, how to counter message those types of things going on within, within these networks. So that goes back to the dem dem democratization of knowledge as well because you may think some things are, but they're not. Um, even though it's open, it depends on who's saying it and why they're saying it and what the purposes are behind why they're saying it. And that also goes back to the notion of, of, of fact-checking and understanding from, a, from another source. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't do that. So questioning why people participate, right? And why, why do they do it? And why do they share? I mean, um, do we all have altruistic purposes for sharing? No. Or so, no. Do you have examples to share? Yeah, because I mean, let, let's face it, it, let's just be honest. If you're in higher education and you're doing research and you're, you're publishing, I hope that you have some kind of belief and passion in, in what you're trying to improve or what you're trying to create. And you don't want to sh just share this with people just so they know about it, but it's ego stroke. You want the attention, and you want other people to, uh, you know, to interact with you about whatever you did, because people don't like to work in, you know, in bubbles. I mean that. That is. I would argue that's part of the work of the scholar, right? I mean, I wouldn't publish in a journal if I didn't want people to read about it. Right. What would be the purpose? Yeah. But then again. My reason for publishing is to is because I feel passionate about education, right? and because I want to I want to work with others to improve education. Um, but we also see this notion of you know managing our our identity and grooming the way that people perceive us online. Right? Obviously, when we participate online, we're not gonna. Well, I would hope that we're not gonna put forward every single thing about us, right? It's this, but, but this idea think, of Royce. Yeah, but it becomes very complicated because, because let's say you're a social science scholar or an ethnic studies scholar or, you know, a scholar in gender studies and you do research in a, in a particular area. Sometimes the fact that you're doing research in a particular area with, pe with particular population already says volumes about you, because um, you know, not just because of the content, but also because of the conferences you attend to present this data and the networks of people who are interested in this information. So that already creates an identity for you. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, back to kind of this, this thing. I, I mean, one of the personal an example. I yeah. so. During the during the, uh, the the keynotes, you know, I tweet. I was tweeting a little bit, right? By virtue of tweeting, I do this very, you know, the conferences that I go to. So by virtue of that, you pick up more followers. By virtue of that, your cloud score goes up online. You're so so now you're in different circles. And you're increasing that. So so let's say that I now have uh, instead of uh, you know that I've increased to and on Twitter thousand two thousand followers, which is not by any means what it, what it is, but that, hypothetically. And all these different circles. Now, if I say that oh, maybe this idea is good, or this thing should be thought about, or that there's something, there's a potential that a lot of people are going to potentially agree with that, and that then it gets retweeted and moved, moved along. Now you've got something, something moving that stems, and then you get now it's it's, it's uh, you know you get more followers on that, and it increases. So you have this this notion that um, that you can have this idea power and a lot of people back to the, the, the motives may do that for various reasons but a lot of it has to do with you know let's say you're a consultant you want to increase your 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 uh, ability to 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 command higher consulting prices you want to increase your footprint those types of things so you do that for reasons and sometimes you target it fortunately i try not to do that but at all, and I don't have any, but, but that's just a kind of example of how, how these things are leveraged. Any other issues that you want to bring up, or issues that were, I'm not sure who's putting things on there, but that, that's great. Um,
Great. Do you want to bring up the one of the topics that we've been thinking about from our slides and then push forward the discussion? Um, I, th I think um, civility is an interesting notion to think about. Um, and again, thinking about the structure of the systems that, that uh, we work in. So think about Twitter, for instance. Um, you know, what it, think about what are the limitations of Twitter. If Twitter is the basis for my interactions with, with specific people or a group of people, um, and I'm limited to 140 characters, how does that translate into how I participate and how people interpret what I'm saying? And how does that, I guess, I mean, going back to the issue of literacies, right? So, so what are the lit literacies associated with being an effective Twitterer? And, um, and how does that translate into, you know, it was brought up this morning in the keynote, just ideas of, of societal polarization in the US today. You know, so much of it is that you know, we, we are inundated with information, inundated with, with polarizing um, snippets from, from different groups. So, so I guess how does that relate to, to us as scholars um, and how we conduct our work and how we connect with people? That makes sense. I want to someone wrote on here devil's advocate, and I want to bring up that question. Um, so the question is, what is knowledge? Um, so the question is, what does knowledge work have to do with how scholars act in social media spaces? Um, would, would the person who wrote that question care to expand on it a little bit? I, I, I'll say something. Sure, go ahead. Okay, well, I mean, I think that scholars are in the business of knowledge making, right? So, uh, OER, I mean, it's distribution. How do you get ideas? You read, you respond, you keep them. It's just, it's, um, but probably the biggest thing is you talk about agency. So, agency at an individual or the global level, and people, I think one of the big kind of, uh, <coughs> exciting aspect of all this is you can now have agency at a much larger level uh, because instead of a small like uh, it's opening the classroom doors instead of a small you know, shut the door and you know, talk to other people it, it creates it breaks that down and so through various portals people can have uh, an impact not only on their own little bit of classes or uh, programs they're members of their disciplines, and maybe even beyond that. So that's the making of knowledge in, in, in humanities anyway. Way higher. Yeah. Uh, different sciences. Sure. So to, to paraphrase that question, um, let me pose a different question and say, does participation in social media space that has nothing to do with knowledge production? Does knowledge get generated in social media space? How is knowledge? Is it by scholars sitting in front of their uh, computer um, tapping out, out equations? Maybe if you're a mathematician um, and you know, you're trying to find proof to a certain theorem, let's say. Um, how about if you're an educator and you're trying to figure out um, I don't know, how to engage females in computer science or how to reduce certain in inequities that exist in the educational system? How do you do that? Isn't that through social participation and engagement in college? I think this gets back though to your original uh, thoughts about um, the sort of schizophrenia of, you know, I'm a scholar, I participate fully as myself. I'm, I'm a scholar and I have personal stuff. And I don't use social media because it's all personal. And, and I think that gets back to the, it, it's agency, but it's, why you're using social media, who you are, and if you feel comfortable, you know, building knowledge on Facebook, or you know, is that really what you want to do, or are you just there to see your mom, or whatever, you know, are you there to just talk about the football game with your friends? And and I think that's a really that's a good question for scholars, and um, I know a lot of scholars who who don't differentiate between their personal and their academic life. And I think they're the most successful that I've seen uh, that can actually help build knowledge in those forums. 
um, because they participate more and they bring their work into their social, their private life, and vice versa. So. Um, go ahead, and then I'll, I'll get back to Jim on that. I'm just interested to think back to Lawrence Peter talking about a uh, wonderful analogy he had, Peter Principal and writer, of uh, a breakthrough in a field and somebody sort of digging a hole and, and everybody else joining in to dig the hole and the hole getting bigger and bigger and bigger and then all the world's experts are sort of at the bottom of the hole and then finally some grad student rebels and goes and starts and digs another hole over here. And it seems to me that the social media exacerbate that, if, if you take that concern, by um, probably exacerbating a tendency for people to go with the in thing. And, and uh, on the other hand, the social media also bring much more awareness, and so maybe that also um, increases the, the likelihood that somebody will say, wait a minute, this isn't right, and go over here. So uh, it intensifies it, and it speeds it up dramatically. Um, but whether it's better or not, it's, it's, it's hard to determine. And just, just to clarify, you know, we're, I don't think either of us is higher to take a lot of a perspective, you know, better or not better or, or worse or anything. You know, trying to question these assumptions that go that go unstated and that, that impact our lives as you know as teachers, as educators and researchers. And questioning both kind of the systems that we find ourselves in, whether those are you know social media systems or whether those are institutions, because I mean let's face it, the way that people interact, uh, you know, either in conferences or in Spaces mediated by the values of the institution. Sorry, can I just make a correction? Sure. I said Peter, it, it was Ed, Edward de Bono, lateral finger. Oh, okay. Sorry, just to clarify. Yes. I'm coming into this late, not having been here from the beginning, but it seems like partly what we're addressing here is sort of perennial tensions that we have between individualism and communitarianism and, the, and, and, and production knowledge. It goes back to Plato. I mean, to be produce knowledge in individually in solitude, or to be produce it in, in concert with others in community. And um, you know, if you look at the humanities, there's lots of literature that sort of celebrates the genius of the individual scholar working in his solitary peril, off the grid completely and cloistered from the world at large. And yet, you know, there's Socrates who's walking around uh, in public. And not writing, but his knowledge is produced directly face to face in concert with other people. And so there's this parental attention, at least in the humanities, about where we where we produce knowledge and where, where quality knowledge is produced. And it's something it's something I bring up with my students is you know these things in terms of trying to reflect um, deeply about the world around you and the fact that the digital technologies are reshaping this space and our ability to connect with others is something that we want to be reflecting on. We want to be thinking about the degree of connectivity that we have vis-a-vis -vis, um, ourselves and how much time we spend alone in solitude and what is the best way to sort of think about the world in, in a clearer, more deep sense. Um, those are sort of perennial issues that we need to weigh and re-weigh. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, there's, there's lots of pressures, right? Yeah, there's technological pressures in how that are shaping how we're thinking about knowledge. And there's there's social pressures and there's cultural pressures, right? With, with this, um, I guess, move of lots of institutions in society that are thinking collaborative ways. You know, do we, is the idea of the lone scholar still valid? Probably, probably not. Um, is there one way to do things? Um, most likely not. I was wondering when you interviewed and, and, and talked to the professors and the instructors, if they discussed the compartmentalizing, for example, the one that was very confused. Um, for example, maybe you, you know, I, I know, I use LinkedIn for specific professional things. I use Facebook for more for family things. I use Circus for 
for, uh, for other things. Or within now that Facebook has changed the circles, you've got the ability to then structure your friend structure around how you want to organize what you're doing so that you can well, essentially have multiple identities and within these. The, was that brought up or, is, or are those skills that needed to be that need to be thought about or taught when you were discussing or helping folks use? That's a great question. Um, and they did. Um, yeah, yeah, interesting. So, um, like what you're talking about can, reflects how I use social media, right? Um, but I think part of it gets back to you know these were these were run-of-the-mill college of education professors. These weren't ed tech people, right? And so I think um, you know thinking these things through, uh, they haven't gone to that point yet. So all these professors, as far as I know, they all had at least tw tried Twitter, had tried um, a variety of other social media, but the only ones that they even used even a little bit was Facebook. Um, and so even though they had like tried different spaces, I guess they hadn't gone to the point yet where they saw value in segmenting or fragmenting themselves in that way in multiple spaces. Um, and ultimately, the ones who, who were using social media um, you know, regularly, it was, it, was out of pers it was for personal reasons. And whether or not they were able to successfully connect that with their professional identity depended upon how they saw themselves. Um, but I think I think kind of the, the model that you're talking about, I think it would have been appropriate for some of them if they had certain, I guess, beliefs about the value of connecting with colleagues through Twitter, for instance. Um, but but they, they didn't. And I'll just say too that some of them, it was really interesting because some of them entered Facebook with this desire to use it as a professional space. But it was interesting to them or it's shocking to them how it quickly transformed based upon the assumptions of, of, of Facebook, right? So um, it quickly became a very personal space, and that's what led to the conundrum that they were living in. Um, so even though they may have had good intentions, they weren't able to, I guess, successfully, maybe lack the literacy or the foresight to successfully fragment themselves in a way that they would be comfortable with. So does there need to be a, uh, basically a social media literacy to, to help people guide them in the way they might want to structure usage and, and navigate these waters, so to speak. Well, I, I, think that's, I think that makes sense, and I think that makes sense for how I see myself. But again, thinking to like the first professor who, whose quote I put up there, she saw herself as a very kind of unified person, much less fragmented than I see myself. I see myself as personal life and I have this professional life, right? She saw it all as one. And so I just wonder at, again, to create some type of, um, uh, I don't know, literacy objective to, to help professors to learn how to fragment themselves. That carries with it assumptions about how we see ourselves, right? And that the assumption would be that other people see themselves the way I see myself as kind of having these multiple identities that I play out, um, which may not be the case. But it could be the choice. I mean, right, right. It's just, you know, they, how you see yourself is how you use it. But, yeah. And there's, you know, there's steps. So there's initiatives. Um, towards getting faculty members and, and um, you know, PhD students who, who are, you know, future scholars and are currently scholars um, in getting them to think about these digital literacy, right? So, for example, Athabasca University has run this, um, this one-week um, course or, or workshop in the past two summers where they brought, and Terry Anderson and George Siemens brought in people uh, to think about you know networks and how they relate to the work that we do and how you know how our scholars participating and what what it is that they're doing in those spaces and what how we can participate more productively. <coughs> we haven't been mindful of the number of these issues that we're that we're bringing up here. We have about maybe five or five minutes left. Um, what I want to do to close is to um, give you a chance to look at the document, um, reflect on it, and, um, and then we can you know, answer some final questions or you know, bring up other issues that you see. Um, and then we'll just close. Um, yeah. It's a common practice, right? And obviously there's various um, motivations behind that. Um, and and I do that every every paper that I publish I post it on my blog. And that's you know, there's there's various reasons for doing that. One is yeah, to get your, your paper out there. And the second is to get it out there so that you don't have to wait two years for it to appear. And, and, and also
also, you know, if it is published in the in the enclosure, you can provide um, the PDF on the documents. Um, we see lots of you know all the open access work that's been done, or, or the open <coughs> so for example, Martin Waller's book, the Athabasca University Press books. They they get a lot of mention on social media. And I think it, it's for well, the perspective that I pick it's for the cause, but yeah, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll have the motivation. Um, but then one might say, well, do the motivation matter? If you're putting, you know, this this information to the hands of the people that would be valuable to them and to their work, does it matter whether you know um, you're not doing it for altruistic purposes? In terms of like uh, with open scholarship, like how do you guys look into like social media and then like I don't know something with like Google citations for like your papers or something like that or how those like I don't know because I guess like citations within Google Scholar are like a form of social media already, but they're not like as I don't know. I don't know if that makes sense. So there's lots of work that being that's being done in the social well in the publishing space in terms of evaluating the impact of your work, right? Um, and journals have tried to come up with various ways to evaluate that. So for example, um, IRODL, which is another um, Athabasca University um, initiative. So uh, the IRODL journal, you, know, you can track the downloads for your paper. Right? And some of, the, some of the physical science journals have included things like commenting and you know, tracking on other social media spaces, comments, and, and, and hashtags for those articles and whatnot. Um, the question that I find really interesting in, in that space is how universities um, recognize and evaluate that, right? So you, you cannot, so I'm a, a faculty member at UT Austin, right? And, and I'm an assistant professor going up for tenure at some point in the future. I'm not going to be able to take the meal and download from um, journal X and say, hey, you should do this based on this. Even though, you know, I think that that should happen. But, you know, is the institution going to value that? Then to, you know, is that going to be valued the same as, you know, publishing in journal X that's ranked 5 out of 150, you know, using some, some random metric made by some corporation? Um, I think you want to relate to that is the uh, NDLTD Network Digital Library thesis and dissertations, where you know folks used to have a, an audience really of a committee, four or five, and now and eventually, like since like Simon Bosley, what like a decade ago, over a million. I'm sure it's probably like two million in distinct IP addresses now. So um, that is just very exciting to see graduate education really matter. And I think some institutions, I, I don't know which ones are developing repositories. And I think that uh, you know these things are all going to evolve as we find ways to aggregate it and better sort of understand the implications. Like what like he's suggesting with um, you know, the people who cite you and that sort of thing. So an so important question is this is how do you run your work that's done on social media spaces? And how does how do you reconcile the culture of different institutions and you know the metrics that we use to evaluate social spaces in, in online spaces? Could you log into your site and put it on the slide? Oh, sure. So we we'll have a couple more minutes to get a final couple more comments. Mm -hmm. Sure. But I guess within what you just said, if you were applying for tenure tomorrow. What would you say about your, like, I don't know, this talk and the ideas here? How would you sell yourself? Um, so different, okay. <laughs> that's a good question. 
So the way that one, you know, prepares for the future differs, right, between individuals. And the way that I have prepared for the future is by, by being, by existing in this hybrid space, right? By publishing work that I would, I think would be valuable to people who are reading open access journals, or by publishing work that practitioners would find, you know, valuable in those outlets that are easy for them to access. And then by publishing the work that, you know, most people in this group, let's say, might not find interesting to those journals that the institution would buy. So for example, you know, I have publications in open access journals, but then I have publications in the journals that, you know, the field values and the that individuals in peer institutions value as well. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Harry Anderson. I don't know if you mean tender, but yeah. 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 Harry Anderson and I had this, this discussion at the, years ago at the Madison Distant Dev Conference. And it was interesting in that you know, how do you how do you manage your work um, when you're at institution X versus at institution Y, you know? What the values of the institution that you're in, how does that structure your scholarship? And how does that you know change and um, shape the scholars that you that you want to be in that you want to come to? Right. So the the notes are, are on there and they will be on there. Um, and again the, the URL is uh, piratepad.net slash scholar. Uh, feel free to add resources after we're done. Uh, feel free to uh, copy, paste, and share, share the document. Um, as, I guess as, uh, as the session goes, it's yours now. Um, and feel free to make what you want out of it. Thank you for coming and thank you for participating and sharing uh, your insights.